And we were standing approximately where the present walk that we take comes to City Hall Plaza. And that's close to where David Walker had been in his, on Brattle Street. And I said, Abolition? David Walker? And what about Mariah Stewart? And what about my friend William Lloyd Garrison? And I said, we could do the three of them and make that a feature of what I would call Abolition Acre. The Beacon Hill Scholars, a group of local history enthusiasts here in Boston, have labeled this area of downtown Abolition Acre. During the early part of the 19th century, it was the center of an enormous amount of agitation and organizing in the effort to end slavery. They've created a walking tour of Abolition Acre and are working to establish an exhibit that will honor our nation's early racial justice heroes who lived or owned businesses in that area, David Walker, Mariah Stewart, and William Lloyd Garrison. The community of free and self-emancipated blacks in Boston and Massachusetts arrived long before the Revolutionary War. An escaped slave from Framingham, Crispus Attucks, a man of African and Nipmuc descent, was among the war's first casualties when he was killed by British colonial troops in front of the old state house on King Street in what would be known as the Boston Massacre of 1770. After the American Revolution, the uh, white people who supported the ending slavery take cases arguing that individual black people uh, should be free. Eventually, these cases made their way to what was a very new, the Supreme Judicial Court. Chief Justice put them all together and he decides that based on the new constitution for the state of Massachusetts, slavery is unconstitutional. So in 1790, when you had the first United States Census, Massachusetts was the only state in this brand new union that recorded no slaves. That's the drawing card of Boston. At the beginning of the 19th century, some 1,850 African Americans lived in Boston, about 3% of the city's population. The community was made up of free blacks and those who had escaped slavery in the South. So you're free, but you also want to be somewhat independent inside your economy. What people are like that, those are people who can have their own businesses. And David Walker ran a clothing store. David Walker played a prominent role in black civic institutions, including the Prince Hall Freemasonry, the Massachusetts General Colored Association. Walker also served as a writer and Boston's subscription agent for the New York-based Freedom's Journal, the country's first African-American-owned and operated newspaper. So he's doing this work, but he is also thinking what ways can black people overcome the situation that most of them are in, which is slavery. Walker's most bold and courageous contribution came in the form of his radical call for the immediate end to slavery and discrimination via his appeal to the colored citizens of the world in 1829. The appeal is directed to African Americans who were enslaved and he and other African Americans work to get that appeal to the very people um, that they want to be affected by these writings. Addressed to black people north and south, but the problem was getting it to the south. To distribute his appeal, Walker tapped into connections he had in the south through the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and Freedom's Journal. He also found creative ways to ensure that his inspiring words and ideas were shared with those in the south who were denied the right to read. And one of the ways that it arrived in the south and created it incredible consternation there, was that these very same Siemens gear copies were hidden. He sewed copies of his pamphlet into the lining of coats that he sold to black sailors headed for southern ports. 
It was a complicated system. David Walker wrote this to be heard. He knew that most people would not be able to read it. And of course, the white people who are in the South realize this and, and try to do whatever they can to stop this from happening. Walker's appeal caused a panic among Southern political leaders and plantation owners. They feared it would encourage the enslaved to revolt at a time when slave resistance was growing in many areas. The governor of Georgia offered a reward of $10,000 for his capture. Mariah Stewart and David Walker knew each other, and it is clear from a statement she made during one of her speeches she was quite inspired by him. She said, And if there is no other way for me to escape, he is able to take me to himself, as he did the most noble, fearless, and undaunted David Walker. David Walker was a political mentor to her, there's no question. It's more than likely that Stuart met David Walker through her husband, because Walker and her husband would have been in cahoots in terms of getting Walker's proclamation um, spread as far and wide as possible. Several years after Walker's passing, Mariah Stewart was inspired to become the first woman of her time to speak publicly in front of an audience of men and women. In 1831, Stewart spoke out publicly against tyranny, victimization, and injustice as she had felt them affecting her life, her community, and her nation. This document stands as the first political manifesto written by an African-American woman. She had a full-blown, born-again religious experience. What she said was that the spirit came upon her and she was utterly changed and became someone who had a singular purpose. Her entire life was focused, focused, focused on the cause of black liberation. Stewart had asked the editor of The Liberator, William Lloyd Garrison, to review and critique some of her essays. Garrison gave her encouragement by setting one of her submitted essays for press in the next issue of The Liberator. Well, you know, he's just starting the paper. So, here comes this determined, capable black woman writer who walks in the door with a manuscript. You know, Eureka, what more could an editor ask? Encouraged by the Liberator publisher, Stewart accepted an invitation to speak at a monthly meeting of the New England Anti-Slavery Society at Franklin Hall, Boston, September 21, 1832. She would talk to a group of uh, women first, and then some men sat in on one of her talks. And all of a sudden, there were 10 men the next time, and then there were 20 men the next time, and they really began to follow her and listen to her. What she did was address the kinds of public gatherings, the community gatherings that said, here is how the black community should function. William Lloyd Garrison and Andrew Knapp began publishing The Liberator from their Cornhill Street printing press in 1830. Garrison and Knapp at first struggled to get the paper up and running, they got their initial support from some of the African-American women of that community. But they were primary in helping to give support to his efforts to create the Liberator. His Liberator could never have existed if it had not had the support of that community. Many white people who were opposed to slavery um, but for William Lloyd Garrison, that was his whole life. He believes that you can explain to other people how terrible slavery is and people will change their mind. Agitation was his role. He was agitate, agitate, agitate until people were moved to be abolitionists. The African Meeting House, built in 1806, and the Abiel Smith School, constructed between 1834 and 1835 at 46 Joy Street, 
were built and supported by this community, as well as many successful merchants and entrepreneurs who marketed their wares and services in and around Abolition Acre. That meeting that my ancestor was taking minutes, he came to that meeting. They have him, David Walker, arrived trying to sell them on the idea that they should support uh, Freedom's Journal. I know they knew each other. Not only that, Henry Tyler and David Walker had clothing stores on Brattle Street. In 1828, David was at 42, my ancestor was at 80-something. In the early 1800s, all African Americans living in the North were on heightened alert because of the federal fugitive slave laws. These required that all escaped slaves be returned to their masters after capture. In 1850, uh, we passed a fugitive slave law that has teeth. That means that a whole, of the, the kind of status quo of runaway slaves has changed. Southerners see it as an advantage to make a point that they can get these people back, right? They want to show the North that the North can't harbor these people. Suddenly, white Bostonians had to take a stand. Would they be complicit in returning people to slavery in the South? Or would they try to stop it? The black community and their white abolitionist allies led the fight against implementation of the fugitive slave laws. But now a growing number of whites added their support. They saw attempts to enforce the law as the South trying to impose its will on them. The African-American community continued to defy the fugitive slave law by any means within their power. And some of the more notable cases, such as that of Shadrach Minkins, resulted in a successful escape engineered by Robert Morris and Lewis Hayden from the courtroom to Canada by way of the Underground Railroad. Although rescue attempts of Thomas Sims and Anthony Burns were unsuccessful, their freedom was eventually purchased by money raised through church offerings and contributions from white anti-slavery supporters, solicited by the Reverend Leonard Grimes, pastor of the 12th Baptist Church, also known as the Fugitives Church. How could this barbaric system continue to exist in these United States, a new nation founded on a declaration of equal rights for all? The sense of Working together, pulling together, communicating, connecting. These were people who recognized that there was a very um, deliberate cap <laughs> on just what was available to black people. So this was an extended community that said, we're going to explode that. We're going to create our own, if we have to start our own businesses. Well, black people here then don't isolate themselves from the reality of what's happening in the rest of the country, but they use their free advantage right, to be more outspoken about what should be the goals of black people. They found a way to survive. They persevered. Uh, they were strong. Uh, they were strong and, and was able so, to survive all the negative things that uh, surrounded them. There has never been anything in America worse than slavery for African Americans. Never anything worse than slavery. And we were able to overcome that.
I keep on.